Thank you. Um, thank you for coming. Um, yeah, uh, in this talk, I'm uh, I, I will continue to talk about uh, some result from uh, this Tigris simulations, which stands for three phase interstellar medium in galaxies, resolving evolution with star formation and supernova feedback. I'm quite proud of this acronym. Okay. So, <laughs> so the first part, I, I'm going to talk about the galactic winds or some signature of these galactic winds uh, from this tiger simulation is mainly driven by supernova explosion. And the second part of this talk is I'm actually, the it's not about the synthetic observations from uh, this tiger simulation. Uh, mainly, first talk about the synthetic observation from our previous simulation, and I want to discuss possible extension uh, or possible application using this synthetic observation uh, with this tiger simulation. So, um, I, I bring this picture again. So this is uh, my uh, broad uh, schematic picture of this galaxy evolution that we collect all the gas uh, through this uh, dark, uh, large scale uh, gravitational interaction between dark matters. And that will form a very hot gas uh, within this dark matter halo. And that hot gas can cool down to form stars within the galaxies and also which it will form uh, for to the uh, galaxies as a warm and cold medium and eventually uh, turn into the molecular medium. Then we'll go to the stars or the supermassive black hole and then they will return energies to uh, this gaseous medium through the radiation, winds, and also supernovae and through some I'm not really, I don't really know, but uh, maybe there's some mechanism to blow these thing, uh, energy things away <coughs> from this agent feedback. So the reason why we need uh, this kind of large scale interaction is because we know that this uh, star stellar mass function is much, uh, yeah. the stellar mass, from the, this stellar mass function, we know that this gas, or not all the gas turn into the star. So only one third of them at, at most turn into the star at the maximum efficiency. But at low, uh, low mass halo or low mass galaxies, there, uh, maybe the supernova feedback blow things out so that quenches the star formation. And at, maybe the, at, in the high mass halos, AGM feedback do this job. So, there, we need these winds, but also we also saw uh, this kind of winds from many uh, observations. So, okay, we need to blow things uh, out from the galaxies. So how, how to do that? Mainly the, uh, maybe the supernovae, since the supernovae is the most energetic process, especially for this stellar feedback, we can blow things away, out from uh, galaxies when we include this supernova feedback. But from this cosmological simulations, we cannot really resolve the every uh, supernova evolution from their uh, early stage to the later stage of their uh, shell formation and the uh, pressure driven snowflow and the momentum conjugate snowflow, all these kind of stages. We cannot really resolve this. And how can you do that? Uh, there are also uh, some different way of implementing such kind of feedback uh, mechanism. Interestingly, they will produce a uh, large, largely different uh, structure of the uh, galactic or intercluster medium. They may look quite similar for some cases, but they are completely different from some cases. So these details of the uh, subaggregate physics do really matter. So even in this kind of case, Actually, they, are, they can control their feedback by tuning their parameter, so-called here, so-called delta t. Then you can really get this star formation rate quite okay for all, all the cases, but you will get outflow rate very differently uh, depending on what, on what you used for this uh, uh, subaggregate physics. So you can actually make 
uh, large, heavily mass loaded wind here, but sometimes you only can get about 10% of the uh, outflow rate uh, compared to the star formation rate. Can you remind me what delta T is in this? In this, in this uh, so this is a, a so-called so stochastic model. Um, they are kind of collecting supernovae that uh, make those uh, some their feedback make the temperature at around uh, their given temperature. Right. So, so that's the temperature of some hot bubble that is created by a supernova. Yeah, they are kind of uh, adding the supernova before exploding, and then uh, once they get this kind of temperature, they uh, now explode this all this uh, collected supernova. So by increasing this number, you will collect more supernovae before explosion. So then you will end up having much, much hotter, uh, some more energetic super bubble. Uh. So, so this, sorry, go ahead. Go for it, James. <laughs> I was just going to say, this is, um, I just want to understand this figure, because I think your point's well taken. But this is the mass change as a function of time. And so there's, you, you, you presumably the, the star formation rate is being balanced by this outflow rate, which Outflow rate is dashed line? Yeah, yeah. Outflow okay. rate is dashed line. I, so higher delta T huh? is a higher outflow and should be a low? Uh, but I mean, this star formation rate okay. can really uh, <coughs> regulate it. Uh, Just the mass loading that's varying, right? Yeah, the mass loading. So what the, the, you can really get a, pipe, a good star formation rate in any case, but that results uh, in quite different outflows. And also, they may not only this kind of rate, but also this uh, temperature structure and all this uh, intercluster medium structure, they may be completely different based on your subgrid physics. So what's the height of the box that we're looking at? Here? This one? It's like a couple of milliparsecs. Uh, I'm not really sure, but maybe they, so since this is a kind of uh, global simulation, so they may measure it by yeah. based on Right, so I mean, this this is a uh, I think oh, I see. 10 kiloparsec okay. uh, size. I see. Yeah, but I don't know where they measure this value. So I'm just thinking, I mean, for sure the subgrid physics matters, but like the environment matters in a big way too. What the density profile of the CGM is and whether it's rotating. Yeah. I mean, this stuff goes back to like the 90s, right, where it made huge differences in how mm -hmm. collimated the flows were. Sure. sure. Yeah. At this point, this is kind of just uh, some. Uh, Experiment uh, only they only change this uh, with physics, and I think this one is kind of since, since this is a, a 10 to the 9 uh, solar mass halo galaxy, I think so. So that they can really resolve uh, this supernova feedback by uh, just using simple thermal dump. So they compare this result as a reference with this kind of thing, but even in this case, they are kind of uh, not exploding individual supernovae. That they are uh, exploding multiple supernovae at once. So but what is their CGM like in this simulation? Um, I'm not really sure. So this is, uh, I, I think they kind of adopt some standard, kind of standard test problem of a cooling halo, which may be used uh, kind of standard, standard, standardized in this uh, Agora comparison simulation, I think. That's, I don't really, uh, no, sorry. Okay, so that's maybe a big problem. So we, what we want to really do is, based on this local simulation that I'm learning, uh, trying to understand this uh, stellar feedback, their impact on this warm and uh, warm cold medium and also the hot gas through this uh, self-consistent self cycle of the star formation. Uh, but I not really uh, working, uh, I didn't really include all other kind of radiation wind kind of thing, only considering this uh, supernovae. But uh, yeah, the radiation is somehow uh, indirectly included by changing heating rate, as I explained yesterday. So, but the mainly, the supernova, uh, the wind kind of properties are uh, depending on the supernovae. So I went. <laughs> Uh, I want to focus these things first. So, um, I want to, uh, before I go into the, my really complex simulation, I want to uh, 
explain how do supernova feedback work uh, in somehow simpler uh, idealized case. So somehow all theories mainly developed for the supernovae, the radiative supernovae remnant evolution in the uniform medium and uh, uh, in single uh, in one dimensional spherical model. So actually there are lots of other physics they uh, try to include even in 70s like two phase uh, two phase medium uh, or inhomogeneous of the medium and also thermal conduction. But um, I it's not yet really uh, well understood because all those models still based on their one dimensional spherical model by just including some of effect uh, with some prescription. There's not many direct simulation uh, for uh, including all those effects. So at this point, I am only uh, want to show difference between the single supernovae and the multiple supernovae case and uh, explosion in the uniform medium and the cloud medium case. I don't really talk about the 1D spherical expansion, but I want to compare some result with three-dimensional expansion that I'm uh, learning. So, but I still don't really include all these kind of other effects, but they uh, maybe uh, somehow at some point very interesting to uh, consider. Especially this thermal conduction is one of the issue, but this uh, actually uh, need, it need actually somehow, we need to model this thermal conduction using, uh, including the magnetic field effects because of this anisotropy of the thermal conduction. So I defer this kind of study later, but yeah, this is uh, another kind of big, uh, I mean, there are lots of things to still, uh, we can do uh, at this, in this. So in this, this uniform versus cloudy yeah. medium, I mean, the real ISM is, is turbulent. Yeah. So rather than putting in some sort of PDF for a turbulent spectrum, it's just you don't have the resolution to do that? No, no, no. I mean, the, why, why, uh, why not to I mean, the, the turbulence, uh, I, for the turbulent case, I would say that's kind of naturally in our uh, somehow more realistic simulations. So that turbulence itself is self-regulated in that case. Mm -hmm. What I only uh, want to compare it here because uh, uh, between the uniform and the cloudy medium, the one motivation is because many people actually just thought that when it, the medium was uh, inhomogeneous, all this kind of hot gas just flow out through those low density channel. But I would uh, want to say that is not really <coughs> true when the background medium is this uh, two phase intercept medium that is we can really think of this uh, cloudy structure. So, yeah, that was. So you're the, doing numerical experiments. Right and just varying one of these things yeah, yeah, yeah. each time. Yeah. And in your full simulations, these are cosmological? No, 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 it's, yeah. a, okay. it's a local simulation, yeah. Okay. But I will show you later. So yeah, this is a single supernova evolution, including the cooling. So <coughs> first time, first uh, those, uh, uh, some local uh, energetic uh, thermal energy, uh, the local, uh, localize this supernovae energy is expanding uh, as a blast wave that form uh, this set of Taylor stage of evolution. And uh, as time goes by, this uh, will cool down uh, at the shock, first time at the shock. Then they will form a shell. And then and after the shell formation, they still can have a hot interior. They can push the shells by uh, uh, push the shells by adding more uh, momentum so that can uh, describe as a pressure driven snow flow and then in later time they just uh, have this momentum conserving phase. So this can be uh, described like here. So at early time the profile is really like a set of Taylor solution and then it, the density gets higher as they cool so that we form a shell at this point. And then uh, even in after the shell formation, you can still have this hot uh, interior that can really push, uh, overpressured interior that can push uh, the shells a little bit more, then you can get somehow higher or momentum end up. Uh, so that's a typical <coughs> uh, evolutionary scenario. And that is also uh, true, especially this kind of uh, explosion in the two-phase medium where we can 
we realize this two-phase structure by running uh, thermal instability uh, simulation and take some saturated snapshot and explode uh, supernovae in there. So mainly they are kind of propagating uh, through this one medium, but they, their one medium still shock and uh, get suffering this uh, shell formation. And then during this uh, evolution, they can really boost their initial uh, momentum to the uh, about a final momentum uh, by about factor of 10. It is also true for all these uh, uh, cloudy medium case where we use about 10 different realizations to uh, uh, for this background state. So, so simple conclusion here I got is this uh, momentum, final momentum per supernovae here. Here is just a single supernovae. It's always around 1 to 10, 1 to, 1 to 3 times 10 to the 5. Weekly, very weekly, depending on the uh, uh, background density. But so how, how big a range did you vary that background density? Oh, over? it's a 0 0.1 to 100. So, yeah. yeah. So I'm just like, I mean, you know, this could be going off in a molecular cloud, or it could be going off mm -hmm. in a so, stellar wind group. Right, right. So I mean, the range and conditions. Yeah, if it was really uh, uh, exploded within the a molecular cloud that just fully surrounded by uh, uh, was around those supernovae with uh, about 100 particle per cubic centimeter. Then actually, it really cools very quickly. So it's about about thousand year after thousand year, it will just form a star uh, form a shell and then cool down interior. They will just but their momentum injection is still uh, about this order but they will not really expand that large, uh, so that it just stay there. I mean, the, you, you, you will not, if you just see from the outside, very large scale, those expansions just stay there, so. Yeah. Just le there's just more inertia in the density. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so even in a, in a stellar wind room bubble, you think this would still be good? I guess what I'm that's what I wish. Is, is this a good number for any environment you could go off? Uh, that's, yeah. In the Milky Way galaxy, or yeah, and also it's uh, inter one interesting thing is the this is a kind of parameter we also uh, uh, plug into our previous uh, the self-regulation uh, picture as a turbulence driving coefficient, and this number is a kind of required number from the observation actually, or from the object by. by just including the turbulent pressure and the star formation rate, our uh, basic uh, theory of uh, the separation picture give us star formation rate should proportional to the turbulent, uh, no, sorry, turbulent pressure should proportional to the star formation rate. The coefficient will be this momentum, final momentum, divided by the M star parameter, which is the uh, um, total mass of new stars per supernovae. It's about 100 solar mass. Then also, there is another question about the one force factor, but that uh, give that actually uh, give the coefficient between this pressure and the uh, star formation rate substantial relation. And from the observation, we can just convert it uh, reversely. Then we what we need is uh, really of about this amount of the momentum. So that can really provide by some other process, but. But our, based on our uh, experiment, supernovae can really provide this amount of the momentum or somehow or, always. So that's, that's kind of some argument that supernovae is a really dominant process uh, that can drive the and regulate the star formation. So yeah, this uh, is kind of huge amount of momentum. So, mm, so that means in uh, most simulation when include the supernovae then you should get this amount of momentum. Is so there an order of magnitude way to understand this number? Sorry? <coughs> is there an order of magnitude way to understand this number? Oh, yeah. So that is, uh, you can just, uh, you have this total energy. And then uh, this shock velocity, and usually the, because those cooling, very strong cooling occurs at around 10 uh, of a million Kelvin. So then that actually gives you a velocity around uh, 200 km per second. So if you just, uh, those, energy, those 10 to the 51 are divided by this uh, 200 km per second, that will be the 
the momentum you, ha you really <coughs> have at the end of the set of Taylor stage. Why is it 200? Is that, is that it's about the temperature of this uh, 10 to the You're 16. saying you never, okay, I see. Yeah. So that at, that at that temperature, you yeah, yeah. suffering very strong cooling, you will lose the uh, uh, internal uh, pressure. You're you can't, you're shocked. So then you, you start to, you, you will exit from those uh, energy conserving stage, yeah. So at, during this energy conserving stage, you will keep adding the momentum, but uh, at, at the end of the energy conserving stage, the you cannot really add the momentum. There will be some slight addition by those uh, pressure-driven snow flow phase, but that's just a brief phase. And okay. So yeah, but uh, there is really a kind of numerical requirement to get this right momentum. So when your uh, resolution is very poor so that you cannot really resolve this shell formation, then also, then that means you cannot really resolve this uh, uh, set of Taylor stage. Then you, your uh, momentum should always stay at the level of this kind of ejecta level, so that you, your final momentum is always stays here. To get this right momentum, you should have this uh, kind of uh, resolution. You should satisfy this kind of resolution requirement. That is actually about you should have about less than 10 parsec resolution for the uh, case when the density is around one or if it, it actually need a much higher resolution when you need to do these kind of things uh, at high density. What is RSF? That is a shell formation radius, the radius at the shell formation. That is, can you, actually we can just uh, analytically calculate this. So, Okay, so similar thing, uh, I also uh, uh, did some similar experiment with this kind of toy model with this pulse uh, by uh, keep adding this supernovae with this time interval, 0.1 million year here. And then since we, we, can, we keep adding this energy, this, uh, it will keep expanding. That means we can keep adding the uh, momentum and so we can replenish this internal hot gas. But actually, it is very, the cooling is very efficient, especially at the, the end, after this shell formation. After the shell formation, you, the addition of the hot gas uh, by each supernovae is much small. So I will come back to this later, but I first go to the result for this uh, momentum injection. So. So this is a, a, some different uh, uh, different model with a different density, oh, no, different density, and the different time interval. So when you so then and each starts actually the kind of final momentum of each supernova event. So there is a, some variety and also it somehow there is some reduction when you add very frequent uh, the, the supernova very frequently, but it still stays uh, on range of this uh, level, not the order of 10 to the 4. So we can still uh, get, we can still say uh, we uh, usually get this level of the momentum injection per supernovae from this supernovae explosion. So what do you, I don't quite understand what, the, what you're learning from this multiple supernova. Mm -hmm. I mean, you calculate the momentum from injection it's momentum, so it should just add like a vector. So wh what am I learning by doing this calculation that I didn't know from just doing one? Um, so I mean, the, this kind of explosion uh, will just, uh, first we'll uh, heat up the uh, surrounding medium and then add the hot gas. And as this, they just keep expanding, there are a lot more gas that can be accelerated by this kind of event. And then uh, the, fa the momentum is will keep increasing, but as so for this case, but as function of time, we also uh, increasing number of the supernovae, right? Just and then what this shows is just a divi div uh, division of these two. So I divide the total momentum to the number of supernovae that is has been exploded at that time. 
But all your supernovae go off in the center and right, right. periodic. So is that really the right? No, no, no. Is it <laughs> to be canceling? Is oh, that's not. So I mean, the, that will be the, uh, uh, that, that should be, I mean, this is a kind of some uh, toy experiment. We can just uh, get an idea of uh, this multiple supernova effect. So the, that the real situation is much, uh, completely different, and all those kind of canceling effects will go into a play. But I mean, they are mainly driving the turbulence. So by uh, colliding those kind of medium, then they can still, I mean, we can still say each of the events will inject certain level of the momentum. I mean, in principle, could the energy conserving phase last longer because it's yeah. over right. so, so this shell formation <coughs> time, actually now I kind of uh, can uh, re formulate the shell formation time. It is originally depending on the uh, somehow single energy, uh, energy of the single supernovae and the ambient medium density. But now I can actually <coughs> write this with this uh, delta T uh, in this kind of just formulation. Then you can see this shell formation time is decreasing when you uh, increasing this uh, delta t, which means your uh, interval is longer than the shell formation time is shorter. And if you just uh, explode it very uh, frequently, you can expect longer, uh, larger shell formation time, which means longer energy conserving state, right? Okay. So, and then I want to add one more thing about this hot gas mass, which is uh, quite interesting. So, <clears throat> this is a hot gas mass per supernovae. Uh, and as I explained also, uh, this hot gas mass can also keep increasing since we keep adding this energy. But also, this is a kind of uh, dividing the total uh, hot gas mass with the uh, uh, number of supernovae at that time. So. What this shows is uh, this hot gas mass per supernova as a function of time, but normalized with this shell formation time that I showed before. And all line up where we this shell formation ready, uh, shell formation time. Up to this time, they keep increasing, but it dropped very rapidly because they now start uh, cool, and then they stays somehow uh, at around 10 solar mass to the 100 solar mass. They can go up by uh, 10,000 solar mass before the shell formation. And then I can really, uh, I can also draw, uh, write, uh, plot this as a function of the uh, super bubble radius. Uh, and now it's normalized with this H, but the H is not really the scale height, just a, a kind of proxy of the scale height, depending on the number density, background with number density. So. It, it just give a sense that when uh, this radius reach around one scale height or the two scale height of the background medium, they now uh, really just break out from the uh, galactic disk, not really uh, going up from this, uh, stay in this uh, near uniform mid plane region. So then we can just say, okay, that maybe this kind of mass will really blown out uh, by the process of this super bubble breaks out. Then uh, what we got for uh, this uh, hot gas mass per supernovae is around uh, 10 to 100 solar mass, which will give us this uh, mass loading factor uh, of 0.1 to 1. So, so this, what this says, when we really breaks out this super bubble uh, after this shell formation time, then we always uh, have this somehow low uh, mass loading factor. We should have this low mass loading factor. Or, oh, oh, it, this is all about the hot gas. And then, or if we can really break out those uh, super bubbles before the, this uh, shell formation, they can may reach uh, mass loading factor, they can give a mass loading factor around 10. But to make this kind of things happening, actually, we really need very, very short uh, time interval, which can be translated into the mass of the star cluster that uh, we need real kind of super, cluster, super star cluster. But that may be really the case of this um, uh, starburst or galactic <coughs> center, uh, starburst center of the galactic, uh, uh, starburst galaxies. But 
uh, not really kind of usual uh, case. And so, also then what about this uh, warm and cold medium that can maybe uh, accelerate it? So if I just look at this uh, somehow gas mass that is that has velocity higher than some given velocity, so this is a <coughs> function of uh, uh, velocity. So that let's say uh, to get about velocity higher than 200 km per second, that is always stays in this 10 solar mass range. But if we just look at this uh, about this range around 50 to 100 km per second, we, we can sometimes get uh, this cumulative ma uh, mass around 100, or sometimes get, we can get some uh, 1,000, which <coughs> means um, so this this is, this kind of this includes those warm medium that is accelerated by uh, this superbubble expansion. So. If those uh, galactic potential was shallower so that uh, the escape velocity is small, then <coughs> maybe this gas can escape, which can give us uh, some higher mass loading factor. So yeah, that is kind of thing we can uh, learn from this uh, simple time model. Then what we want to really do is now learning this of some more realistic simulation to check uh, whether this is okay or not. So, 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 so your star formation here is all like a <coughs> single burst, right? A single cluster. Yep. I mean, and you're saying you're not getting quite enough oomph to get the stuff out. So if I go put the same cluster in a smaller galaxy, maybe it will work. I mean, likewise, what about putting, you might not have a bigger cluster in the same mass galaxy, mm -hmm. but if you had some sort of interaction <coughs> that drove gas yeah. inflow to the center, right. Right. I mean, what's the largest so that's, first size you've considered here? I mean, the, so I mean, the star cluster is not really the meaning of the single star cluster with mm -hmm. that uh, high mass. It's maybe the uh, collection of effect within some scale. Mm -hmm. That scale maybe you can just think uh, is the scale height of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. So for the galaxy center, that may, the, that scale height is a bit smaller. <coughs> so that's a, uh, let's say that we're doing 10 or 20 parsec. If we have a 10 to the 6, we have this 10 to the 6 solar mass or 10 to the 7 solar mass of new stars, then they may give some uh, strong enough burst. Uh, right, but this is the center of a galaxy. It could be 10 to the 9 solar yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's. But have you, have you considered those scales? Or? So that I will, uh, I want to really consider, but yeah. at this point, in our, for our simulations, uh, yeah, we don't really uh, go that uh, range. But that seems like another plausible solution. Sure. Of going yeah, to that's the really one galaxy. thing we really want to do. I mean, <laughs> and actually, yeah, that's also quite interesting because as, uh, uh, we uh, uh, discussed in the morning, so because star formation, there is some time delay between star formation and uh, this first supernova event. And that can be uh, about a few million years to the 10 million years. And if those, if we go to this kind of very, uh, Galactic center region, then the dynamical time scale is much shorter. So that can be shorter than this time delay. Then we can keep collecting this uh, possible uh, supernova source uh, during that time, and then first at some point, then that will give a much stronger effect. So yeah, that's that will be some kind of beyond of our equilibrium picture, but that's a really possible solution. So we can really want to go there. Okay, so uh, let me go to some realistic simulation that I include all these details of physics, self-gravity and single particle evolution and uh, some, uh, with some realistic, uh, I, 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 I shouldn't say this is a realistic, some model of this population <coughs> synthesis uh, of this 5 radiation and the supernova ray. And including the supernova feedback with uh, high enough resolution that can resolve all this evolution. And supernovae can also explode it in the star cluster and also run away that can represent collect this correlated supernovae and also specially distributed supernovae. And also using this uh, sm uh, local shearing box, we are uh, learning it with uh, differential rota uh, galactic differential rotation that may be very important uh, in uh, prohibiting this uh, large-scale gravitational collapse, and also it is very important for 
uh, maintaining this mean field, magnetic field uh, through this dynamic process. And uh, we learned this uh, long enough to erase uh, initial conditions that may be very transient uh, due to the initial con uh, some idealized uh, initial condition. So I'm sure uh, I will show you uh, uh, time evolution of the density, temperature, pressure, and the uh, vertical velocity, and the magnetic field strength uh, in radial vertical slice and the mid-plane slice. So I think yeah, this is the second time uh, uh, I'm playing this movie, so you may be more uh, familiar with that. So we, we can we, we form the zinc particle, this color the zinc particles uh, from this uh, then uh, gravitational collapse, and then they will uh, also shooting those runaways that are uh, uh, coming from some our chosen prescription and. I should make this loop. But <laughs> and then, yeah, those star clusters host multiple supernovae, and each uh, runaways can explode at some point uh, with some single supernovae, and then they making this uh, super bubble blown out, and the hot gas is going uh, out, and the warm gas also somehow accelerated, but mainly stay there. So. By, by this kind of process, we, I already showed that this star formation rate is well regulated with the uh, changing of this thermal uh, the heating. But uh, also we kind of lose all uh, gas from the local box through the uh, star formation by uh, converting gas into the star and also through this mass loss uh, at the boundary. Uh, so we, we really have this outflow, and then you can now first get an idea that uh, this mass loss is not that high. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's comparable to the star formation rate, or much, uh, actually, it's smaller than the star formation rate. So that's just the mass loading that you got in your idealized experiment? Uh, yeah, I will show that uh, numbers later. So, yeah, this is just kind of cumulative evolution. So, uh, Yesterday I said I will explain this tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow. So uh, this shows the temperature and the velocity plane with the uh, uh, mass weighted uh, probability density distribution. So most gas is in the warm medium state, and uh, this warm medium has a temperature around 10 to the 4 Kelvin, and their velocity range from the uh, uh, range up to the 100 kilometers per second, but they cannot really go beyond that. And they and the cold medium is stays in the about 10 km per second range, and the hot hot medium can only get uh, reach uh, the temper uh, the velocity around uh, uh, a few hundred uh, km per second. And this is just velocity magnitude. So if we just think about uh, one dimensional velocity along the vertical direction that can really escape, it's just a, uh, you should multiply uh, one over square root of Three, yeah. So the important thing is the kind of maximum velocity we get for this uh, one medium is still around 100 km per second. Uh, I just want to show this. Uh, we now we have this nice distribution of this cold from the temp uh, temperature around 10 to the 1 Kelvin to the uh, 10 Kelvin to the uh, million and 10 million Kelvin. And it is nicely distributed within this uh, variation of this uh, uh, mean variation of this uh, heating rate. And uh, there are lots of uh, hot gas out there. <coughs> and if we look at this outflow rate, uh, to look at this outflow rate, I draw net outflow rate, which uh, is uh, defined by this outflow rate minus this inflow rate. So that uh, this cool gas that showed, that means I uh, tend to uh, uh, gas with temperature less than 10 to the 4 Kelvin, their rate is keep decreasing, which means they may eventually force back, not really going out. Uh, this is uh, our box uh, size. So 
but the hot gas actually uh, can really uh, go out because they, uh, their net flux is actually conserving as a function of vertical direction. And we, when we also look at this Bernoulli parameter, they are also constant as a function of height after uh, this uh, one cube parsec. And we also learning this bit with some of bigger box and look at this whether this uh, outflow rate can change or not, then the, still the hot gas outflow rate is stay there, and the warm gas outflow rate is actually going down, keep going down, because now you can see the, there are lots of warm gas blobs out there, even at around two or three kiloparsec, but their velocity is sometimes, it's actually merely already bluish, that means it's falling down, and some of them actually accelerated only a few tens of kilometers per second, <coughs> while their hot gas has velocity higher than, uh, larger than this, about a few hundred kilometers per second, they can really escape. So if I measure this uh, mass loading factor at the bound, uh, boundary of our simulation domain, only for hot gas, uh, then we get this outflow rate over star formation rate around 10% for all different uh, gas surface density. So we go try to go to 100 solar mass per parsec square, and there are some several uh, technical difficulties to go there. Especially we use this kind of some optically thin approximation for the heating, but that is not really true for this case. Uh, and their dynamical time is very short but our some cluster evolution time is much longer, so that we want to cover uh, at least a few cycles of this stellar evolution, but that actually requires lots of cycle of this, uh, dynamical cycle of this uh, region, so it was quite difficult. But the bottom line is this hot gas uh, only give us about mass loading factor around 0.1 that is really consistent with what this thing expects. And uh, mainly also we use all kind of the gravitational potential correspond, uh, 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 corresponding to this uh, somehow Milky Way-like gravitational potential that has uh, escape velocity around a few kilometers per second. So that means they cannot really escape. But we can still measure their outflow rate because uh, we, we, we have this boundary at the box. But we can, if we measure outflow flux at uh, one kiloparsec or <coughs> two kiloparsec, they are decreasing. That means they may not, they will just falling back. It is true for other uh, surface density. And there is also trend of decreasing, decreasing trend of the increasing surface density because our box size actually effectively decreased uh, Increasing uh, by since they are really uh, their scale height is much small. So what this says, but we can still say okay, there are still lots of warm gas out there. They may contribute to the outflow if there is other mechanism that can accelerate maybe the cosmic ray feedback. Then if we, we add this to the outflow, then we can get some uh, mass loading factor around one. But that's kind of our expectation um, somehow, but that's may or may not true. And if we go to the uh, some shallow of uh, low mass halo or shallow of potential, then they also may can escape, then that's also can be, uh, in, can increase the mass loading factor. The thing I want to also make uh, is this numerical convergence. So this is a simulation using two parsec resolution, and this is using the 64 parsec resolution. Definitely, they are very different from this one. I think this change somehow shows from this resolution and completely different here. So yeah, this kind of expected result because the supernovae feedback uh, is not that efficient or not correct uh, at low 
measurement. <coughs> but we still kind of inject uh, kind of final momentum when the supernova is not really resolved. So that actually gave us a correct star formation rate surface density up to 32 parsec, where we didn't really have, uh, we, we, we have very different ISM structure. That means uh, some hot gas uh, volume filling factor within the scale height that is near the midplane, that there's no hot gas actually uh, for this low uh, resolution case. And also, if we measure the volume fraction of the warm gas at a high vertical coordinate, then there's no warm gas out there with this low resolution simulations. So, yeah, it's kind of uh, somehow. Where, where do cosmological simulations land on this diagram? Uh, I'm not really sure, but uh, let's say the near large box simulation, their resolution should be a kiloparsec or about 100 sure, parsec. Sure, like a zoom. For the zoom, so okay, zoom in simulations, they are trying, they are claiming their resolution is about up, uh, sometimes a few parsec and uh, sometimes 10 parsec. But I mean, it's really hard to say uh, whether that resolution is really the resolution we are really meaning. So sometimes, especially, especially for the particle based code. Yeah, exactly. right. um, and the other issue maybe is since usually they, for the grid based simulation, they are using this uh, AMR approach that actually uh, make the resolution very poor at, uh, sorry, at this uh, coronal region. And, and then they also cannot really expect those uh, uh, cold gas out there. So. so yeah, I'm not really sure, but yeah, they, so some, some actually claims they are resolving uh, this individual event and they are resolving those interstellar medium structure where. So maybe we want to really compare those things. But the conclusion here is at this point, uh, the hot gas, the, mainly the supernovae driving uh, real, uh, fast and hot galactic wind that only give us about mass rain factor order of 0.1. But this, uh, it is still possible that we can uh, make heavily loaded hot wind uh, with uh, this star, uh, super bubble breaks out before the shell formation. And the warm medium is also accelerated up to this level so that maybe uh, we can, if they are escaping, they can contribute to the wind from the slow uh, dwarf galaxies or if they are further accelerated by this cosmic feedback. So, that's quite an uh, interesting thing. So I'm, I'm going to move on to synthetic observation while I'm, although I don't have that much time, but can you, uh, do you guys have uh, other questions about this part? Well, yeah, I'm curious, I mean, for your supernova-driven wind, mm -hmm. um, I mean, like, there's the old, like, Chevalier and Clegg 85 solutions. I yeah. mean, so you can write down an analytic solution in the idolized case. I'm curious, right, when you actually do a simulation with a real two-phase ISM and you put in your supernovae one by one and stuff, I mean, how different is your result from the analytic solution? What, do you, I, what, what new insight do you gain? I mean, I areas? would say that Chevalier and Craig model, they need a, a mass rotating factor as a parameter, right? It depends, yeah, I mean, they, can, they parameterize that, they parameterize the, there's a variance of that, right, that Bo Ki Wong did with radiative cooling in the wind. Okay. But it would be interesting to know, like, how what you find with the numerics compared to the analytics. Yeah, I mean, the, um, in our case, uh, <coughs> this uh, is kind of mass rotating factor we can get from this supernovae explosion, supernovae driven uh, wind uh, in the state of the hot. But yeah, I mean, <coughs> there is a, uh, so yeah, I assume that those uh, uh, model with the uh, cooling uh, that can, they uh, saying that the multi-phase uh, wind can uh, be a result of this uh, cooling from the hot uh, wind. That may, assuming this heavily loaded hot wind, I, I, I assume. 
so that they are somehow trying to argue that uh, is really growing out from the center of the galaxy. Uh, and yeah, at this point, I cannot really tell that this is really uh, this is really possible because I didn't really uh, have a model for this kind of thing. And so that's the thing I really want to uh, look at right now. Yeah. And uh, for the simple model, I mean, the difference in our case, it's, it's kind of we are only can give uh, uh, somehow information of the foot point of the wind. They will further accelerate it by this uh, adiabatic expansion stage. But that's not, that is not included here. So, but I mean, those kind of, those kind of acceleration is only possible for this volume filling hot gas, not for the, this uh, warm gas. Things so if there's there are there are there are this amount of mass that is available, but they are in this one medium pace, then they I think they will not really accelerate by this process. Those those acceleration is only for this hot gas. Then uh, for high uh, heavily loaded wind, we still need a heavily loaded hot wind, not uh, this multi phase wind in the first place. Then those multi-phase wind can only be uh, accelerated by some other process in uh, our simulation if they are not uh, really escaped from uh, from the uh, this shallow potential. So, yeah, that's the other thing we uh, want to really go like uh, this co-simulated feedback. So, okay, okay. So uh, I will a little bit about the synthetic observation. This is quite imp uh, important to build the synthetic observation because most physical properties in the simulations are not direct observable. So it is very useful to construct these synthetic observations basically for this effort to effort comparison or somehow, sometimes the observational, um, the physical properties driven by from the, uh, the uh, derived by observation, it, they assume some, uh, sim they made some simple assumption to get the, uh, to make this uh, observational diagnostics. So we may really want to test whether this can give a real physical properties from this realistic observation, uh, realistic simulations. So I did this for my previous simulations for two phase medium. Uh, self-regulated by the supernova feedback, but not that realistic. Um, but we, we, I did uh, somehow uh, radiate transfer for given uh, ray uh, along that ray and do these things for entire skies. So the way to develop this is just first get the, this line of sight data from the density, temperature, velocity. Oh. For, and I develop, I, I construct the uh, H1 21 centimeter lines uh, in this case. So using this density, temperature, and velocity, I kind of calculate this emissivity and the absorption coefficient uh, with uh, including some different uh, excitation mechanism. But it's actually quite, uh, I then realized that that is not that simple, uh, even though it is just a simple two level population uh, lines, but there are some other excitation mechanisms I should think, uh, I should include, but it's not really well known. So called the uh, Lyman alpha uh, scattering, resonance scattering, the, I cannot really pronounce it that, uh, his name, but maybe his name. So Paul Tyson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there we, we so called this WF effect, uh, both both times. Yeah, fails effect. So, yeah, but we don't really know the this Lyman alpha uh, Lyman alpha uh, radiation photon density. So, I should assume some uh, value, but it is not important for the cold medium, but it is important for the warm medium. But then I can construct this uh, lines with uh, by using some. Uh, shape function. So this is some example. If I got extract this uh, line of sight information for density and the temperature and the velocity, I can calculate the spin temperature. Here you can see uh, as red line, red dotted line for without this WF effect. 
and this blue dotted dash line with this WF effect with very simple prescription by assuming some constant Riemann alpha photon density. They only affect uh, very low, low optical depth region with where the warm medium is dominated. So warm medium is, uh, uh, yeah. So this is a kind of some old sky map that I only uh, show. I only show this for the purpose of to. <coughs> Maybe you can think this is quite, uh, looks okay. So I, I want to, you feel like that. So, but I did some uh, detailed comparison between, uh, by uh, plotting all this uh, brightness temperature and optical depth distribution. And there are some several uh, absorption and emission uh, observation that can, I can really compare. Then I, I would say that a distribution was quite okay. So it can reproduce those kind of uh, typical interstellar medium, uh, typical uh, neutral interstellar medium quite well. So now what, what, we can, what can we do? Why is, why is a neutral interstellar medium the first place to start for probing galactic winds? I'm just trying to understand. No, no, no. It's not uh, for the galactic winds, sorry. So this is a, I just want to, uh, I just go back to the, some uh, basics of the synthetic observations. and. Uh, I will go to the uh, galactic winds later, but I'm not really at, uh, at that stage. So this is the kind of thing I did before for this neutral interstellar medium. But I think I can do similar thing for my uh, new simulations to get some idea about this galactic wind. What feature of your simulations are you testing here? Here, so I mean, this is actually, uh, so I can construct this uh, lines from that them and that lines are quite uh, uh, somehow some in some sense it's quite realistic especially for this uh, neutral medium then I can really compare uh, their uh, column density estimator using those lines which is uh, usually uh, you can you can get this column density by this kind of equation by integrating this absorption and emission lines then compare this with the real uh, line of sight integrated uh, column density that, that we, I have. So then I can see, is this okay? Yeah, I also say this so is okay. This verifies that your simulation produces the right amount of cold neutral medium. Uh, not really, that's not uh, the proof of the hour simulation, it's the proof of the observational diagnostic. Okay. okay. So, I mean, the, I can, First, I want to compare, uh, I want to do this because I want to uh, say, okay, their observed properties are really okay. Then I can really directly compare our uh, measurement with the observation directly. Then whether they are agree with each other, then I can say, okay, my simulation reproduces it well. But if they are not, then okay, my simulation may miss something. So that's the kind of purpose of this study. So for this study, I just uh, check this kind of diagnostics. They, we can uh, get this line of sight integrated column density quite well using both absorption and emission line. But you don't, if, when you don't have uh, this absorption line information, you will underestimate uh, uh, column density quite a lot for high optical depth, definitely. So that's what, uh, but sometimes people only use this uh, uh, optically thin approximation, uh, op optically thin estimator for uh, column density, and then they want to correct it with uh, some correction factor uh, based on this uh, optical depth. That uh, we can some give some idea for that. But actually, the, there was another paper that can, they said they did this kind of thing, but they have much larger correction factor because they, did, they don't really do this numerical simulation. They are just placing all the different warm and cold medium along this line of sight by hand. And then that actually increase a lot for this velocity overwrapping because they don't really have this dynamics information. So that actually, uh, this says that maybe only, yeah, you can actually still get quite okay value uh, at some point. And then the spin temperature also can be well estimated. 
And similarly, uh, using this uh, <coughs> spin temperature, line of sight integrated spin temperature information, what this shows is uh, uh, you can get uh, this cold medium friction quite uh, very well if you assume uh, some with some single temperature, single temperature of the cold medium. And then after that, yeah, uh, other group actually really look at this uh, absorption and emission pair for uh, this uh, Perseus cloud. And then they measure this uh, cold medium mass friction by with this kind of method. And but they should assume the cold medium temperature around 50. But this uh, anyway, this will give the cold medium friction range quite okay. And there is a, they also use some other method, so-called they, they use the Gaussian decomposition method to get this cold medium friction. And they actually matches, uh, agrees with uh, quite uh, okay, except these two cases, two line of sight. So, okay, that's maybe okay. And we can really infer this line of sight into the column density and the line of sight average to spin temperature and as well as cold medium friction through this uh, emission absorption observations. And then we also did some, uh, uh, some more sophisticated uh, model uh, that are used from uh, this group. So they are using, uh, they are developing some auto autonomous Gaussian decomposition method with a machine learning algorithm, very fancy machine learning algorithm. That what they did is they kind of decompose all this uh, brightness temperature profile and the emission profile and absorption profile with different uh, components. And then what we can really do now is because this synthetic observation is really coming from this one, so we can really compare whether this kind of feature really uh, corresponding to some uh, real feature in the uh, intercell medium or the H1 gas along that line of sight. And yeah, that's not really good for if the number of components is increasing. It's only good up to uh, structure num number of structure two or three. If it's the number is larger than that, that means uh, you will really overlap uh, in the velocity space. Then you will screw up your uh, profile uh, quite easily. So it is a reliable method for uh, high uh, galactic latitude, but not that small or low galactic latitude. And then for each component, we can also calculate the spin temperature and the column density for that only component and compare it with some real value. Then that's, I mean, those, those estimation is still wide, at very, uh, has a large scatter for the low latitude, but where the component is really overlaps, but it's okay for high latitude. So their method can give some uh, information for that. Then we can really compare our, with the, our simulation. And then now we can really say, oh, their distribution didn't have this bump here, and their distribution has much more component here. Then maybe come from because we use very simple approximation for this WF effect that actually gives somehow constant spin temperature in all the case. Or the, we don't have this kind of uh, gas that where maybe this kind of may in, uh, indicating the fast moving one medium that we don't really have in this model because we don't have uh, that uh, component, especially for this fountain flows. But in may, it may, we may have them uh, in our new simulation. So it is very interesting to reanalyze, reapplying this method to our new simulation with, and compare this with this broad uh, observation. OK, so uh, and then uh, I want to go quickly. What I can really do with this Tigris? So this now, the Tigris simulation is MHD simulation. Now I can really construct this dust polarization map. And then I want to compare this with the uh, Planck polarization map that actually show uh, E and B mode, uh, E mode and B mode polarization power ratio uh, about two. 
that is on the issue of the, some interesting question uh, they raised from this Planck observation, and I want to see whether we can really produce this from our simulation. And then we can also do some molecular chemistry things and then test whether uh, full rate, uh, full rate trace, uh, whether this lo so-called local approximations for, to calculate the shielding length can reproduce a uh, real full, three, uh, full ray tracing uh, using uh, the chemistry using the full ray tracing. So that was done before, and we also going uh, pushing this forward to running uh, some zoom-in simulation of the molecular clouds that they just extract some part of the our cloud and they running it with uh, MR that can whether we can really see that and. Also, we also want to analyze, uh, once include those chemistry thing uh, with our dynamical model by using some simple, simplified but accurate enough uh, uh, chemical networks. So <coughs> this is also what is going on. And then that actually give uh, some information about this XCO factor variation. That is uh, one very big question. And then, Finally, I can add some ray tracing <coughs> algorithm that can really follow their evolution, their, uh, the propagation of this far UV radiation or the ionizing radiation. That can uh, that I can really see the real special variation of this radiation, and also I can uh, learn some escaping fraction uh, kind of information from this simulation. Okay, so <coughs> yeah, there are lots of things to do. And I will stop here. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Crystal. Well, so I mean, there, there's lots of things you'd like to do with a, a great code like this. Um, <coughs> what is the thing where you think you're? I mean, what is the question where you think you're really going to have the biggest impact here when you kind of weigh what you'd like to answer versus reality of what you can do? Well. Yeah. <laughs> What's your number one question you're going to go after? Uh, so I mean, the right now the um, so this kind of chemistry and the rate tracing thing is already there. So I mean, it's uh, it's just a matter of time of learning it. So <clears throat> it is very straightforward, but it is very uh, it has also quite a uh, imp uh, large impact on this. Uh, our understanding on this CO and the H2 conversion and also this uh, uh, non-equilibrium chemistry uh, kind of thing. So this is a one big question. And also when I include those uh, ray tracing in there, we now can have uh, ionizing radiation effect that can give uh, additional feedback as well as this information of the escaping friction. That actually very important because all those escaping friction information is usually coming from this cosmological simulation where the where they don't really have this fine structure and then from this uh, different uh, very multiphase structure at uh, especially at uh, high z with this uh, ray tracing we can really see whether this uh, escaping friction can really increase and decrease as function of this time and, and uh, as function of the other conditions so i mean those things are also very important question, and I can really step forward to do that. So I would say that is was first priority right now. But the other thing is, uh, since our simulation is mainly the local simulation, so I want to really go to the global simulation where I can really model the entire uh, galaxy. But I cannot really still uh, model with this cosmological flows, but this somehow large scale structure and also with this uh, global effect of this uh, gas evolution, I think that is very important and I, that's the one thing I want to push forward right now. Yeah. Oh, I should, I shouldn't miss that the cosmic ray feedback thing, but I, I would say that has lots of uh, uncertainty. So I need lots of help from the experts uh, for that. Uh, Fit, so, yeah. Okay, uh, we've been keeping him from lunch all day, so I think uh, <laughs> let's, uh, 
Uh, uh, so Evan, if you could just go down, that would be fantastic. And let's thank uh, John Gu again. Thank you.